Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, doing a quick video. I had a, a comment in one of my old uh, salvation messages about repentance and having sorrow for sinning against God. And someone actually asked this question, how does one have sorrow towards God? How does one have sorrow towards God? Yes, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're still going through this um, with repentance. People denying repentance. So... Let's go through it. First, what the scripture says. The scripture says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. In the Old Testament, repentance, when God does it, it's a change of mind. When mankind does it, it's a change of heart. Okay, we go from being happy with our sins and okay with our sins, and, the, and ignore, either ignoring the consequences or being okay with the consequences. I've come across brother, uh, not brethren, uh, the lost world where they'll admit being sinners and they admit that they're on their way to hell and they don't care, they're having a good time doing it. Go ahead. But today, we've talked about repentance, how it gets so confused today and so messed up today to the point where people are saying repentance is a work. Repentance isn't a work. Uh, repentance is just a change of mind. You're trying to play God. Okay? God, when God repents in the Bible, it's a change of mind. When man repents, it's a change of heart. Okay. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Got a biplane going by. A little small airport nearby. There they go. In the Bible it talks all the time, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Okay? All heaven celebrates over one sinner that repenteth, okay? For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We talked about this in previous studies on how um, repentance, the ability to repent has always been there from Adam and Eve, okay, till the present day. Repentance has always been there. Okay, when it comes to God saving you, repentance has always been there. Okay? But I'm going to make it just simple. Just something simple. We're going to talk about it, okay? I don't know if you can read it. My printer's not working. <laughs> I hopefully I don't have to buy a new printer, but my printer's not working. So, um, but sin. Here's how it starts, Brother Sis Christ. People always get stuck at this point. We're going to start with a simple scenario as a child. You have a little child. They know the laws that their, that their father put down. Okay, and they broke that law. They broke the rules of the house. Okay, the law, the, God, the the father sets down the rules. The mother helps um, enforce them. But the parents are the authority. The child is the child. The child broke the rules of the house. So what's the first thing he's going to have? He's going to have fear of getting caught. And we've all been there, brothers and Christ. If you've truly gotten saved, this is the first step. You have a fear, okay? The Bible says that the laws of God are written on every man's heart. In my lost life, there were some things I did that I knew was wrong. I just, I knew it. It wasn't a morality thing. It's the laws of God that are written on man's heart. They try to do away with that and say it's morality. So you have a child that breaks the rules of the house, and the first fear he has, he sinned, first fear he has is he's, he's afraid that he'll get caught. Why is he afraid he'll get caught? Because he's afraid of judgment. So the first fear he has is he fears that he's going to get caught. And what happens? The mom or the dad catches him. But we're going to use this scenario where the mom catches him. Dad's at work, mom catches him and says, hey, what you did is wrong. Now stop for a second. The next thing that happens is that child, they no longer fear getting caught. They just got caught. They no longer fear getting caught. Right now they're upset and angry that they got caught. Then they're sorry that they got caught. See the stages? They get angry that they got caught. Then they get very sorrowful that they got caught. They're not sorry towards God. They're just sorry they got caught. Hey, you did wrong and you got caught. Then what comes next? the judgment then the mom says okay you're grounded to your bedroom until your father gets home and you know when your father gets the father gets home he's going to get a butt whooping 
there's going to be judgment. The, the punishment's there. The, remember the crime? The sin is there. Here's the punishment. Now you have people you have people that fear the punishment. The child just fears the punishment. They're not sorry for what they actually did. They're sorry that they got caught. Now they're sorry for the punishment. They're going to get a butt whooping. Now in a good if you're raising your child right in a good home after a while when that child's been sitting there on the bed for a while thinking about what he did wrong and fearing that punishment you know what should happen? Not always, but what should happen? The child walks to the authority, authority, the child walks to the authority, his mom, and says, Mom, I'm sorry for what I did. I shouldn't have done that. Let's say he waits till Dad gets home and Dad's about to deal out the punishment, and he goes, Dad, I'll take the punishment, I'll take the punishment, but I want you to know, Dad, I'm sorry for what I did. That sorrow towards the authority. That's what true repentance is, brother, sister, Christ. Let's go through this again. You and I are sinners. Let's say, we'll go back to our lost life. We were sinners. We still are, but I'm talking about we were lost sinners. Okay? We tried to hide some of that sin. We tried not to look that bad. Oh, I'm not that bad. Remember the, the Pharisee and the publican. I'm not as other men are. You know, murderers, adulterers. Or like this publican. Okay. You gotta get past that and go, wait a second, I've sinned against God. You're not just acknowledging your sin, you're saying, Hey, I am a sinner, you're stating a fact. This is where you get to the point where you're stating a fact. I'm a sinner. The laws of God are written on every man's heart. God Almighty that created me, I have sinned against God Almighty that created me. And that person gets told. Because of your sins, because of your sins, you're on your way to hell to burn for all eternity, and then the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. The Bible says in John 3, uh, chapter 3, where it talks about, He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Okay. The moment you sin, the judgment is set. That's why children are innocent. Children under the age of accountability, they're innocent. There's no judgment. They're still guilty of this, but they're at the age of innocence. There's no judgment on them. When they get to the age of accountability, the judgment comes in. You've sinned against God, and the cost of sin, the wages of sin, is death. The wages of sin is death. You're under the law of sin and death. And that judgment is you're going to go to hell. So you got some people that try to hide the fact that they're wicked, wicked sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. So you have some people that are hiding their evil wickedness, and they're trying to present themselves as good people. And they're afraid of getting caught. Brother says Christ, they're afraid of getting caught in their sin for the world to see them as they truly are. And when they do get caught, you have a preacher. God sends somebody out to preach against them, saying, hey, you are dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. They get, they have, the sorrow they have is that they got caught. They're sorry that they're, they're caught. They still love their sin. They still have a problem with their sin. They're just sorry that they got caught. Then you tell them about the judgment. You know what they try to do? They try to try to uh, uh, talk themselves out of believing in the judgment. Oh, there is no hell. All is well, there is no hell. You see, that's the world. But you have some people that come to the point where saying, hey, like I said, I've talked to lost people that say, hey, yeah, I know I'm going to hell, so what? I'm having a good time, leave me alone. Yeah, I'm a sinner. Leave me alone, I'm having a good time. Who are you to judge me? Who's to say what's right or wrong? Well, they have the laws of God on their heart, and they know right from wrong. They know it. They're just trying to hide from it. But you get some people that say, okay, yeah, I'm on my way to hell, and then they have a fear of hell. 
And that's okay to have a fear of hell at first. But brothers and sisters in Christ, at some point, the Bible says, Jesus Christ says, don't fear him that's able to destroy the body, but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. The authority. Our fear is not supposed to be on the judgment on hell itself. Our fear is supposed to be based off of the person that can send us to hell. God Almighty through Jesus Christ. God the Father manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, His Son. All judgment has been given over to His Son. God's going to set, set a scores one day. That fear needs to be of God. But some people get stuck on the fear of hell. They never get over it. They're, they're, they're sorry that they're going to hell. They're sorry that they got caught and they're going to hell. But they're not sorry for sinning against the person that can send them to hell. How does one have sorrow towards God, brothers and sisters in Christ? How does one have sorrow towards God? Simple. You come to the point where, hey, I got caught. I'm a sinner. I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. And I got caught. I found out that the judgment is hell. The punishment is hell. Everlasting damnation. And like that little kid that goes to the parent and says, I'm sorry, Dad. Because the judgment's already set. He that believeth not is condemned already. You come to God and say, God, I'm so sorry. He's the authority. Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. I, I know I'm on my way to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I mean, it's a fearful place. I don't want to go to hell. But I deserve to go there. Lord, I've sinned against you. And that's when you get into the next step of salvation. And that next step is belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And when you actually look and he says, hey, this is what Jesus went through because of your sins, that sorrow that you have towards the authority only gets magnified as you go through everything that Jesus Christ went through. He had his beard ripped out. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He was spit upon. He was beaten beyond recognition. Notice they had to put a sign above his head in three languages. It says, Jesus, King of the Jews. He was beaten beyond recognition. He was spit upon. He had his beard ripped out. He was whipped. Had his flesh ripped. He was bleeding out. They didn't just say, okay, let's nail him to the cross. Some people forget that. He wasn't just nailed to a cross. He was marched all the way to the cross with people jeering him, yelling at him. The same people that just a week ago, if you know your Bible, a week ago they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We love you. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Hosanna in the highest. And now the same people are spitting at him, cursing him. They're marching. They're, he's being humiliated. And they're marching him to the cross. And he's nailed to the cross. And at the end he says, it is finished. And you go through that. when You, you were sorry for sin here when it came to just repentance. But that, that sorrow gets magnified when you get told what Jesus Christ did because of your personal sins. I've always got to keep bringing that up, brothers and sisters. It's your personal sins that have to be nailed to the cross. Not the sins of the world, because the sins of the world is not nailed at the cross. You have to go to the cross and have your personal sins nailed to the cross. Jesus Christ died because of the sins of the world, but if you want your sins paid for, if you want your sins washed away, if you want to be forgiven, you have to go to the cross, you and the Lord, one-on-one. -on -one. And when you look at everything that he did, and you go to the cross, you throw the old man at the foot of the cross. And you say, Lord, I was sorry before, but Lord, I am so sorry for what you had to go through because of my sins. Those sins aren't worth it. The sins aren't worth you going to hell and burning for all eternity. Sin is not worth separating you from God. Sin puts a wall between you and your Creator. You come to him broken, and you have sorrow towards the man that can send you to hell. 
You have sorrow towards the man that you actually wronged. God Almighty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. How does one have sorrow towards God? <clears throat> the same way a child has sor is sorry towards his parents for wronging their parents. The same way that, brothers and Christ, that I have sorrow, it's more magnified with what Jesus Christ went through. Like I said, I'm just talking about repentance. When you have sorrow for wronging somebody, you've sinned against somebody and you're sorry, when you say you're sorry, you wish you didn't do it. When you have people that are just sorry for getting caught, they have no problem doing it. They love doing it. But when you're, when you're sorry for actually sinning, you wish you've never sinned against God. Lord, I wish I never sinned against God. How many of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're watching, how many of us look back at our lost life and wish we weren't as wicked as we were? We wouldn't have had such a hard time today, would we, if trying to get our heart right with the Lord and lined up and living a life of Christ? It wouldn't have been as hard. We look back and go, I wish I'd never sinned. I wish I'd never had that addiction. I wish I never had that problem. Oh Lord, I wronged these people and I did wrong by those people as a lost person. I wish I, I wish I'd gotten saved sooner. That's some of the times I say that. I wish I'd gotten saved sooner. Before I made those mistakes. Before I got into those addictions. The whole point of being sorry for sin is that you wish you never sinned. You wish you didn't do those things. When you find out, because the laws of God are written on your heart, and then you have a preacher come by, someone who's preaching the gospel comes by, and tells you what, what sin, more sins that you have. So when you think you've done some wrong, you realize you've done a lot of wrong. You have sorrow for sinning against God. Lord, if I could, I wouldn't have sinned against you. I'm so sorry, Lord. Brother and sister Christ, and, and those lost people out there, if you're watching, that's what true repentance is. Coming to God broken and having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. And that sorrow gets magnified when you get told what Jesus Christ did on the cross, paying the price of the cost of sin as a whole. You know, what, because of the sins of the world, He died on the cross. What He went through to provide a way for you to go to heaven, to provide a way for you to be forgiven, to have your sins washed whiter than snow. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to get close to ending this, but what we're seeing today with uh, among a lot of false converts, a lot of organized religions, they never get past this two points. They're sorry that they got caught, and they're sorry that they're going to hell. And they fear hell. They're sorry they got caught. They fear hell. They're sorry that they're going to hell. But you know what they don't do? They never get to the point of having sorrow towards the person who can actually send them to hell. They never fear the person that can actually send them to hell. Remember we talked about fearing the Lord? It's the beginning of wisdom. One of the things that it starts at salvation. The fear of the Lord starts at salvation and continues. Okay. So what is, how does one have sorrow towards God? That's how you have sorrow towards God, for your personal sins. It's not that difficult, brothers and sisters in Christ. It is not that difficult. And when you've done that, when you've actually truly repented, that belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ is not up here, it's down here. Another thing about that, I'll bring up the pictures again, about the people that sin, they're sorry that they got caught, and they're sorry, and they fear hell, and they're sorry for the consequences of sin, but they still love their sin. They have a head knowledge. When they look to the cross, all these false converts, they look to the cross, they have a head knowledge. But it never makes it down here, because they never have sorrow in their heart for their personal sins they've sinned against God. Saying, this sin isn't worth it. I want God, God's forgiveness. I don't want my sin. And the average Babel building out there, professing Christian out there today, has never gotten to that point. That's why there's so many false converts today. The gospel's watered down. Someone said you missed uh, heaven by 13 inches. It's up here, it's not down here. Remember what the Bible says? It says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Not with the head, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. 
You can, and then 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, uh, 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, 1 and 2 talks about how you can believe in vain. How can you believe in vain when you don't truly repent? When you skip repentance and just go straight to saying, hey, I believe in the, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's up here, but it's not down here. And I've talked to brothers and sisters in Christ and listened to testimonies of people who are truly saved. They fell on their knees when they actually, they were sorry at first, like I said, a little bit sorry at first for their sins. And when, you're really, when you finally hit that brokenness, the Bible says a broken and contrite spirit. You're to have a broken and contrite spirit. God will save them that are such of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. When you, that's what we mean by you come to God broken. You break down and you just start, you just have all this sorrow towards God for your sins and what Jesus Christ went through because of your sins. That sorrow needs to be there. True biblical repentance needs to be there. Don't be deceived. Repentance isn't going from unbelief to belief. Repentance isn't just a change of mind. It's a change of heart. And repentance is not works. You don't clean up your life. You wait until after God saves you. And God, through His perfect written words, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Holy Spirit comes in, opens the word of God to you, and God cleans up your life after he saves you. It's guaranteed. Because when you come to God in repentance and broken and say, Hey, I, I wish I never had this sin in my life to begin with. And when God saves you, he goes, Okay, it's time to get that sin out of your life. It's time to get you on the right path. There's things you're not doing that you're supposed to be doing. There's things you're doing that you're not supposed to be doing. The changed life after salvation. How does one have godly sorrow towards Jesus Christ? It's not that difficult. You come to him broken, having sorrow for what you did to him. You sinned against God. You have sorrow for what God's Son, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, went through. And you turn and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, that it was God's blood that was shed on the cross, that you died for me. You were for my sins, because of my sins. See, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, a lot of people will say, 1 Corinthians 1 4 through 4, how he died and was buried and rose again. They leave out the part where it says how he died for our sins. Where's the sorrow? Where's the repentance? How he died for our sins. Lord, you died for my sins. Because of my sins. Lord, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I still deserve to go to hell. Lord, please save me. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ask God, save me. Repent. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer. And you ask God to save you. And he looks at the heart. It's always a heart. I feel bad because there's some brother, even great men of God of the past, that would mock, did you believe in your head or did you believe in your heart? And they mock it. It has to be down here. Why do we have so many false converts and false religions trying to pretend to be like the, uh, the Jesus of, of this book? Why do we have so many false gospels out there? Because they're taking away the heart. It's supposed to be a heart issue. They're making it a head issue. They're compromising the gospel because if you make it a head issue, I'm going to go back to it. If you make it a head issue, the guys that come and say, hey, I'm sorry I got caught and I'm just sorry about hell and fearful of hell and sorry about hell. When you make it a head issue, they're like, yay, I'll get saved. When it's just a head issue, oh, just say a little prayer. Oh, cool. And I continue in my sin. Now I got a free pass to heaven. Why do you think they keep compromising the gospel and they try to do away with true biblical repentance? Satan doesn't want you sorry towards the person that, that's going to send you to hell. Satan doesn't want to see people get saved. Brother, sister in Christ, we want to see get people get saved. And if you're lost watching this, I want to see you get saved. Truly saved and born again. I was a false convert most of my life. 
when I actually came to God broken in repentance, everything changed. That belief went from here to here, and I actually cried my eyes out. And everything just started going through my head, everything that Jesus Christ truly went through because of my sins. And I look back and go, I wish I had never sinned against God. I wish I didn't put God in that position where He had to sacrifice His Son. I'm so grateful that He did. But I wish I didn't have to do, that I didn't sin against God. I wish I didn't wrong God. I was wrong. He's right. I'm wrong. He's innocent. I'm guilty. Right? There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out, to, out of the way. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Brothers and sisters of Christ, when you're preaching repentance, please stop using the words about repentance. It's just admit you're a sinner. Or acknowledge that you're a sinner. That is wrong. True biblical repentance, it spells it out. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. In other words, it comes before salvation. And you'll never ever repent of true repentance. Not to be repented of. But the sorrows of the world worketh death. These two people here. Oops. The judgment and the sinners, the ones that don't, you know, they have sorrow of the world. They love their sin. They don't want to give up their sin. They don't regret sinning against God. They're just sorry they got caught, and they're sorry for the consequences. That's worldly sorrow. And where does that lead to? But the sorrows of the world worketh death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. If you don't ever come to God truly broken with godly sorrow, for sinning against Him, for, you, for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him, you're still on your way to hell. You can have a profession of faith until you're blue, like run out of oxygen. Oh, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. You, you're still going to hell. If you don't follow the true plan of salvation and come to God on His terms and come to Him a broken and a contrite spirit, having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him, He won't save you. You're still on your way to hell. Now, brothers and sisters Christ, mainly for the, the person who asked that question, if you're lost or you're a professing Christian and you're watching this and you've never had that experience where you've come to God broken and fallen down, I'm not talking about these battle, real quick, I'm not talking about these battle building experiences where they get you all on an emotion high and everybody's tearing up because it's an emotion high with the emote music and everything. That's all garbage. I'm talking apart from that, if you've never had this experience where it's just you and the Lord, none of that garbage, and you don't come to Him broken, having true biblical repentance, true biblical repentance, God's not going to save you. And that's the issue. And that's the thing today in this world, I know there's going to be few that will listen to me, this world doesn't want true biblical repentance. That's why you have so many people attack this, uh, the ministry that the Lord, the ultimately the ministry, God's ministry through Paul that we're all a part of. The lost world, these fakes, these false converts, these wolves in sheep's clothing, they will continue to attack us who stand for true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. And they'll say, oh, you're preaching works-based salvation. There's no works involved. The works come after salvation. But they've never come to God broken and having sorrow in their heart for their personal sins. You look at them, they're trying to justify sin for a season. The Bible's got their number. Whose God is their belly. Who glory in their shame. Who mind earthly things. They're fleshly. They're, they're carnally minded, walking after the flesh, and they think they found a back door into heaven. They're trying to go around this. They're trying to go around God's way. And they've got a very rude awakening coming. They're either going to get left behind, or if they die before they catch away the body of Christ, they're going to wake up and find themselves in hell, burning for all eternity. All because they wouldn't come to God broken and having sorrow in their heart for their personal sins that they've sinned against God, regretting those sins. Brothers and sisters of Christ, the Bible talks about fruits meet for repentance. 
what that means is, is when someone truly repented at salvation, they're gonna, it's guaranteed to have a changed life. You can backpedal. You can resurrect the old man. You can fall, get up, fall, get up, fall, get up. But you're always trying to get back up and you're allowing God to get you back up. You can be convicted and God will get you back up. Uh, God will chastise you as a father would a child to get you back on the right path. And I, he's had to chastise me several times because I was trying to hold on to some things that God said, let go of. But the changed life is a guarantee to those who truly get saved and born again. You're not just supposed to be a verbal witness. Today it's all about being a verbal witness. But where's the living witness? You're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness for Jesus Christ. Examine whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. And it always goes back to repentance. Did you truly repent? That's usually what it goes back to. Did you truly repent so that belief can be in the heart? Or did you try to find a back door into heaven and skip repentance so that belief is just up here. That knowledge. The Bible says how they escaped with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They had the knowledge of the gospel. They had the knowledge of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they don't truly have that belief. It's a lie. They'll lie. Oh, I believe. I... No, they don't. They have the knowledge, but they don't have that belief. I could keep going and keep going, but brothers and sisters Christ, I meant to make this just a short, quick video. How does one have godly sorrow? It's that simple. It's that simple. You come to God broken and have sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him, regretting ever sinning against Him. And then that sorrow gets magnified when you learn about what Jesus Christ went through on the cross because of those sins, your personal sins. That sorrow gets magnified. Oh Lord, I am so sorry. Lord, I am so sorry. That sin was not worth it. I don't want that sin. I don't want to do wrong by you, Lord. I am so sorry. I am wicked. I am filthy. I'm no good. Lord, what do I do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're lost, get saved today. Time is running out. If you're a false convert with the head knowledge, you need to make sure that it was here, not here. To my brothers and sisters in Christ that are saved, that did come down here and happened here, don't compromise the gospel. Don't start compromising what true biblical repentance is as it applies to salvation. And that repentance continues the rest of our life. It starts at salvation, and it continues until God calls us home, either in death or in life at the catching way of the body of Christ. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.